Welcome to this edition of Platform. My name is Mohammed Kudabubakar. The National Commission for Refugees, Migrants and Internally Displaced Persons is a federal government body mandated to provide assistance and protection to various migrant groups, including refugees, internally displaced persons and returnees, etc. The Commission was originally created in 1989 as the National Commission for Refugees, based on the 1957 Convention relating to the rights of refugees and its 1967 Protocol, of which Nigeria acceded to. The Commission is mandated to handle all issues pertaining to refugees and asylum seekers in Nigeria, in partnership with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR. With the increasing cases of migration-related challenges in Nigeria and beyond, the federal government between 2004 and 2009 expanded the mandate of the Commission to include provision of durable solutions to internally displaced persons, coordination and policy development for migration-related matters. The National Commission for Refugees, Migrants and the Internally Displaced Persons, IDPs, is broadly charged with the re responsibility of providing assistance, protection and durable solutions to Nigeria's person of concern, which includes asylum seekers, refugees, IDPs, returnees and stateless persons. This edition of Platform focuses on the Commission's mandate and what durable solutions are being advocated for asylum seekers, refugees, IDPs, returnees, and stateless persons. Our guest is Sadia Umar Farouk, Nigeria's federal, Honorable Federal Commissioner, National Commission for Refugees, Migrants, and Internally Displaced Persons. She is from Zurumi, local government area of Zamfara State, and holds two postgraduate degrees, all from the Ahmadu Bella University's area. They are Masters in International Affairs and Diplomacy in 2008, and Masters in Business Administration, MBA, in 2011. She was appointed Honorable Federal Commissioner in September 2016, 20, September 26, 2016, and since assumption of office, developed a strategic roadmap of action that will reposition the National Commission for Refugees, Migrants, and IDPs as the lead government agency responsible for coordination, protection, and assistance of persons of concern. What are the durable solutions to persons of concern? And how effective are the implementation of standardized procedures of research, data gathering, planning, rehabilitation, reintegration, readmittance of persons of concern? Sadia Umar Farouk, Honorable Federal Commissioner, National Commission for Refugees, migrants and internally displaced persons. Welcome to Platform. Thank you very much, Mohamed Kudu. As usual, we have two a set of panelists, two of them, very distinguished ones for that matter. Joy Osiagu, Manager News, NT News 24, is here. Thank you, Kudu, for having me. Makud Simon Machan, Manager News, and our foreign desk correspondent is also here. Thank you, Kudu. It's a pleasure being with you again. That's why I say I have distinguished panelists, because these are people who are, whose tough it is to talk about all these issues. So as I guide the discussion, you guys will bring the expert questions. Once again, Hajia Sadia Omar Farouk, welcome to Platform. Thank you very much. For the purpose of clarification, who is a refugee? Who is an IDP? And how many of these refugees or IDPs exist officially in Nigeria? Uh, well, let me start by giving an overview of what um, the Commission's mandate is, though you have uh, highlighted that. But as um, you mentioned, the National Commission for Refugees, Migrants and Internally Displaced Persons is a government body that's mandated to give um, assistance and protection to different migrant groups, refugees, migrants, asylum seekers, IDPs, as well as uh, returnees. The commission was established by Decree 21 LFN 2004 to give support and assistance to these uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Originally, that was the mandate of the commission as a fallout to the UN Convention 
1951 UN Convention and its 1967 Protocol, which Nigeria is a signatory to. And since then, the Commission has been um, carrying out this uh, mandate to, to the best of its ability. But by 2004, the mandate of the Commission was expanded via a presidential directive to also proffer durable solutions to IDPs as well as to coordinate uh, migration related matters. Durable solutions in the sense that you, you give durable solutions to people so that they can be able to uh, cater for themselves. It's not just about giving assistance, but you should be able to support people to earn um, their own livelihoods. And that is what the Commission has been doing. Let me go back to the question of who is a refugee. A refugee is somebody or a group of people who have fled their countries uh, for fear of persecution and they have crossed an international border. And these people have uh, to be given uh, asylum in the country that they have sought the asylum for. It's their right to be given that uh, asylum. They are given asylum before you determine whether they should be refugees or not, because they have to go through uh, a process of refugees status determination. And once uh, they, they, they are eligible, is their claims are eligible, they are given the status. But even before a refugee is being given the refugee status and determination, it is uh, mandatory upon the country that they are seeking these asylums that we give them protection and assistance. And Nigeria has been doing that to the refugees that have fled uh, into the country. Uh, so far, we've, uh, in 2017, Nigeria has witnessed an unprecedented influx of Cameroonian refugees into the country as a result of the um, political impasse in that country. And we have received them through different uh, um, points, through Cross River State, Benue and Charaba State. And since that time, we have been registering them. And as I mentioned earlier, we've been giving them uh, support by way of uh, care and maintenance. And we are continuing to do more. The, pro the process of registration is still ongoing. But as at um, today, I know that we have over 30,000 of them that are in between Cross Rivers, Charaba, and um, Benue State. And Mohammed, it might interest you to know that Nigeria uh, does not operate an encampment policy for refugees. Why? So refugees, when they come, because they, their rights has to be protected, and uh, it is it is against the convention to really restrict them to or to confine them to one place. It is good you give them opportunity to move freely as well as to seek for meaningful uh, economic opportunities. So and are that you is what, what the most what the most of the EU countries are doing it to, is, to it Nigerian is, migrants or, or if you like African migrants? Yes. Asylum seekers. Uh, our, our asylum seekers is against the convention? It is really against the convention because the refugee is covered by protection. They are supposed to be protected. And once you confine someone in a particular place, you are infringing on his uh, right to movement. Uh, so we, the Nigerian government does not uh, uh, um, encamp uh, refugees when they come. We give them shelter, we support them. And most of the, uh, the refugees that had come through these um, border towns of Benue, Cross River, and Taraba, they live even within the host communities because they share almost the same cultural values and affiliations. So most of them are living within the host communities. But what we are facing now as a result of that is that these refugees are scattered all over. And the terrain is not, is not very good. Access to the intervention is very difficult. So we've now decided to write to the two governments of Cross Rivers and Benway to give us land where we can keep these people a, a kind of shelter place so for them. We don't, to, to we don't want to call it an encampment because they will not be restricted to movement.
they will not be restricted to movement and they, 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 can, they, can, they can go about uh, earning their livelihoods. Uh, Federal Commissioner, still talking about this issue of refugees and the large number we have in Niger. I remember you traveled to Geneva recently and um, in your presentation the focus was, was on some of the challenges uh, you're facing with this large number, huge number of refugees. What is the response you got from uh, the international community in terms of support to deal with this issue since uh, those who came in are sharing um, facilities with the original owners? Yes, um, and the Geneva uh, conference is an annual conference. Is an, annual conference of executive committees of the commissioners for refugees all over the world. So we, we gather every year to discuss issues and, and the way forward. But as I said, refugees are being covered by protection. They, are, they, are, they have protection and cover at, according to the UN convention. So their own um, status is not as difficult as the status of other migrant groups. Yes, when they come into the country, it's unprecedented. You've not uh, expected that. But when they come, you have to um, live up to your responsibility of um, taking care of them. So nations come together every year to see how they can strengthen the support and the uh, assistance that these countries give to these refugees when they come into their country. And that is why we are always in partnership with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. We work together when these issues of uh, refugees come on board. So what sort of support were yes. you able to get? We get technical support. Yeah. We get even logistic support. Because in the area of this registration, we do it together. It requires a lot of um, personnel. And even in uh, areas of health, we give them some kind of health cover. We share the responsibility. And even on the um, conventional travel document that we are working on now, it's still a partnership between us and the UN United Nations High Commission for Refugees as well as the Nigerian Immigration Service. So it's a partnership and collaboration and we enjoy all this support. Still talking okay. about uh, partnership and support, what, what, tell us a bit about the kind of partnership you have with Switzerland. Well, the, the Switzerland partnership I will call is, is a very good model. And it is so because um, it centers on how you're going to support these irregular migrants when they are coming back home. There's a package that is being uh, modeled for those uh, voluntary returns, people that want to return voluntarily. There's an AVVR package, yeah, an assisted voluntary package for them, voluntary return and integration package for them so that when they come back home, they will be, help, they will be able to have something to do and they will not think of finding their way back uh, to, to Europe, going through all the risks they go through. Now, I'm just wondering, um, uh, Honorable Commissioner, during the height of Boko Haram, a lot of Nigerians took refuge in Cameroon, some in Chad, some in Niger, and so on. Mm. What is your mandate concerning Nigerians who are in other countries as refugees? Do you have any oversight of, uh, on them? And oh, oh yes, they are, they are refugees. In, they are our nationals as refugees in another country. Um, last year, there was a tripartite agreement that was signed between the government of Nigeria, Cameroon, and United Nations High Commission for Refugees for the voluntary repatriation of our nationals that are in Cameroon. And that uh, agreement was to ensure the safe and voluntary return of these nationals. And we have uh, started implementing uh, an action plan to that regards. Uh, there was a visit by both sides of, of the uh, committee, the Cameroonian people came to Nigeria for a common seat together with the 
some leaders of the refugees to come and see the situation in Nigeria and go back and report to their other uh, brothers and sisters what the situation is so that they will be better informed on whether on the decision they will take whether to come back home or not. And then a delegation again from Nigeria, we went to Cameroon, we sat uh, with the government of Cameroon as well as the refugees themselves. And most of them indicated interest that they want to come back home. And in that agreement, the plan of action is there and the principles for the return is there because it says voluntary return. You cannot force somebody to, to return back. And we expect the Cameroonian government to respect that aspect uh, of the agreement. And for us on our part, we should also ensure that when these people come back home, we're able to cater for them and integrate them back into the society. And that is what we're doing. We're almost at the last stage of, uh, of the repatriation before um, we had some little um, technical hitches. And we hope that will resume very soon. Talking of hitches, uh, the Nigerians that we you have in Cameroon as refugees, you said you have about 30,000 Cameroonians here in Nigeria. Yeah, yes. How many Nigerians do we have in Cameroon? We have about 97,000 Nigerians, mostly from Borno and Adamawa State. About 87 of them are from Borno State, while just less than 6,000 uh, from um, at the Mao State. And so far, how many of them are willing to come back? And has your office visited them? Yes, to I, see like their as condition? I mentioned, we went to Cameroon and we went to the camp mm -hmm. where these people are kept. And almost all of them expressed their willingness to want to come back home. So problem? it's quite a large number of the people that want. In fact, some of them even said they, they don't mind to go to another state. But they just are eager to come back home. What is their condition? Um, there? Well, the condition is really is, is good because they have all the basic amenities in the in that camp where they are. There's very good water uh, system there. We've visited the, where they had they have the tanks, and they are going about their normal lives. It's a very massive place where they are. They engage in different economic activities uh, because you know there's no way you can sustain giving people that large number of people uh, relief materials or food. It's just not sustainable. So you just have to open ways for them to engage in some kind of economic activity. Is it the sort of land that you are looking for between Taraba and Benue? That is the sort of land that we are looking for because so that ours is because of the accessibility to take intervention. That is why, because as I mentioned earlier, Nigeria does not uh, support or does not encourage encampment policy. So, but because of the terrain, is mm. there and they are scattered, so it's better you bring them in one place so that you can take uh, interventions. To so them. what has it been the response of the Taraba and uh, Benue State Government? No, not Taraba, sorry, cross it's Cross River. Rivers. Yes, we've written to them and they've responded. In fact, uh, Benue State has already given us a land which we are working on together with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Still talking about reintegration, how do you intend to deal with those who might not uh, want to stay where you want to keep them? Probably they want to return back to their ancestral homes. That is why it is voluntary. They have the right to choose where they want to go back home. But with a caveat that that place that they want to go back must be safe. So even if they want to go back to a place and that place is not safe for them to return, uh, we will not allow, we will give them uh, another option. Well, uh, we, we certainly cannot go away and not talk about other things, but let's, we may come back to the issue of refugees again, but tell us more about this strategic roadmap of action that you developed upon your assumption of uh, duty on the 26th of September 2016. Yes, uh, when I came on board, um, I felt that uh, it is good that uh, we have um, a plan that will guide the activities of the Commission for the next four years. And so we, we engage uh, different people, critical stakeholders, to come up with this strategic uh, roadmap uh, document, which we were able to launch to the 
to the management staff of the commission as well as the other CADA staff for them to buy into it and let us see how we can reposition the commission to be one of the best, if not the world-class leading humanitarian agency in the country. And so far, we have started doing that, uh, especially in the area of um, these durable solutions, which is uh, co-minded. Uh, you cannot um, give a durable solution without really knowing uh, the people that you're going to give this durable solution. So data is one of the key um, aspects of that strategic roadmap. We felt that if you have uh, a robust uh, data management system, you'll be able to efficiently and effectively um, carry out your mandate by way of giving this support and assistance to internally displaced persons. System strengthening is also one of the key actors in the roadmap to see how we can uh, strengthen the system by way of its legal uh, reforms. As it is now, the, commission was, the Commission's mandate was expanded, as I mentioned, uh, via a presidential directive. But we need an enabling act to back it up. So we are following up that with the National Assembly. And it is almost as it's the final stage. There's also the issue of the IDP policy, which uh, we are also at the forefront of seeing that the country adopts a national IDP policy where the roles and responsibilities of every agency that has um, migration or IDP related matter will be spelled out and people will now be uh, responsible for these roles. Because for now, FEMA is doing something else. Neymar. Neymar, sorry, mm. is doing something else. And you are doing it. I, I, I see a situation where, where there could be duplications well, you see, you really cannot avoid overlap. But what we're trying to see with that IDP policy is that, as I said, every agency's role and responsibility will be clearly spelled out. We know what the role of uh, NEMA is or what it should be. And we also know what the roles of the National Commission for Refugees, Migrants, and Internally Displaced Persons should be. Once that is done, I don't think we will have these issues of duplication. Now, why will you wait for that policy? What are you doing in terms of synergy to ensure that you succeed right now? We are working with different uh, stakeholders. NEMA inclusive, we are working with uh, NAPTIP, we are working with Nigerian Immigration Service, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, MBBS, all these agencies that have one thing or the other to do with the issues of uh, IDPs and refugees. So staying on your um, vision, we know that once you are the vision holder, uh, there is a need to carry along those who work with you so they can run with that vision for you to succeed. What are you doing in terms of um, working with those who are in the commission to ensure that they share your vision and run with it? As I mentioned, uh, this strategic roadmap was unveiled. In fact, they, they, we made sure that the active participation of the commission is carried out, is, is, is embedded in that uh, document because they, they were part of the development of the document and after which we had a retreat on the same uh, document of the management staff of the commission, after which we came down to the lower cadre. We had also another workshop for them, for them to own the document and so far so good. Now, on that document, I don't, I don't have a copy, so I don't know the details. But what does it say about um, the psychology of either the IDP or the refugee or the displaced person, whether he's resettled or uh, at the end of the day, he has been exposed. He or she has been exposed to so many things, to violence, to so much trauma, mm. trauma, and so on. Mm. What does your policy say about what do you do with them, really? as they get to settle down, whether in their uh, ancestral places or in some new places? That is also part of the durable solution. Uh, because uh, if people are really traumatized, and they, they, they might lose uh, their, their bearing. So it is very important that you counsel them. We do this uh, psychosocial uh, support to them by engaging experts in that field 
to, to counsel them, to talk to them. That is the psychosocial support. So that we are also doing. Before you even start thinking of uh, taking them or settling them back uh, to their communities. Well, I think we will still need some a li little bit of elaboration from you. Durable solution is an uh, omnibus word. Let's look at what you will be doing in the area of resettlement, in the area of rehabilitation, in the area of reintegration, readmittance of persons of concern. Yes, I, 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 durable solution is all encompassing. Yeah. And this is all the things that you mentioned, is they are the components of the durable solution. We've had a model in KB when we had um, uh, some displacement over the years. We moved the people from there. It's not, it's not like it's like an incursion into a particular community by the uh, Benin Republic. They had they were sharing a nationals of Benin Republic. Yes, so we, we had to move our nationals away from that uh, area to resettle them into another area. We've done that. In this 2018 um, budget, we've also made provision for this resettlement and integration. We are working with the Borno State government uh, on a pilot scheme. To they've given us a place where we are going to build and resettle people. But that also would be a caveat. Even if we want to resettle now, unless the, 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 the situation is safe for these people to return. So what we, we do mostly now is really by way of uh, empowering these people. We give them uh, different kinds of training, different kinds of trade, so that they can be economically self-reliant. Like I mentioned, you just cannot sustain giving people food every day. So that is what our main area of focus, empowerment, empowerment, and empowerment of these persons of concern. And on the issue of empowerment, I want us to look at um, migrants. You met a few of them in New York when you went there for uh, the United Nations General Assembly. There are some migrants that are skilled, and their intention is to come back and give back to the commission. There was a particular person who offered to come and help uh, with training of IDPs in some special uh, areas. What kind of provision do you have for people like that? those who are just coming back to give back to the society. Yes, those, those people, when they approach us, we are ready to work with them as partners. And uh, uh, this issue of uh, migration, irregular migration, is really a, a phenomenon. It's, it's, it's a global issue. Mm -hmm. On our own part, what we are trying to do is to sensitize uh, the general public on the ills and dangers of this irregular migration. Migration cannot be stopped at all. But what we're saying that if you must migrate, you should do it in a safe, orderly, uh, and regular manner. And that is what we are advocating. We are taking our uh, advocacy to, to all the zones. Now we've started going to the higher institutions where really the decision to migrate take, takes place amongst the youth. Well, because the, 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 this supposedly uh, greener green pasture mm -hmm. that people think they will go and get, we, all, we tell them that it's not really the case. So and for you to succeed in terms of advocacy, um, there's a need to work with the sub-nationals. How are they reacting to you? We are working with the um, National Orientation Agency. We are also working with other NGOs to help us carry out this sensitization sensitization to the grassroots mm. and mm. everywhere we have a national migration dialogue mm. where mm. all the critical stakeholders come together to discuss the way forward on how to you know tackle this uh, issue of irregular migration mm. well the, 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 the it's good that you are going to the route to tackle the matter of migration but surprisingly even as people return with horrific stories, others are um, still on the way to go. To go. Yeah. That's right. And in fact, some come back and tell you they will try again. <laughs> Meanwhile, they spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions, to go. What, what, um, to what, uh, to what extent do the family setting, for instance? You see, that is that is just the the human nature. You don't know. Well, on our own part, we are trying our best to see that 
we really sensitize people. And we are giving them um, testimonies of people that went and they, they didn't have it easy. We went to Libya. There was a committee that was set up by Mr. President that was led by the Minister of Foreign Affairs to go and meet with the government of Libya and start the process of evacuating back our nationals that are stranded in Libya. It was a horrific situation. What we saw that day when we went to, 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 to the shelters or to the transit camps where, where they were kept was an eyesore. So, so I don't know how somebody will want to go through that if he's really in his right sense of mind. So we'll continue to advocate, we'll continue to sensitize. And then another thing, we should make provision for these people to engage them so that they have something to do. Uh, I believe if you really have something to do, you have a stake here, you will not want to leave. That's but what is the what is the engagement for perhaps a sister agency in let's say Libya, um, the 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 countries that are like maybe transit countries and so on? Do you have any engagement with those people as regards the treatment? Because recently um, oh, yes. some reports from a North African country shows that they are picked wherever you they get you they pick you and take you to the front line state I mean the border to mm. Nigeria just dump you in the middle of the desert and uh, um, and this so is, You know, most countries will not own up to these things until when you have real evidence. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the government of Nigeria is doing very well to see that our nationals are treated with you, you dignity. Have, you have that better is the evidence in Libya. So we, what, we had what a better we, we had we had a better evidence and since we came back the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been engaging the, the, the Libyan government. You know Libya has mm. issues. It's not just even one government. We're only able to go mm. to Tripoli where there's semblance of uh, sanity. Mm. But most of those people that are really uh, maltreated are not even within that um, vicinity. We can't even access yeah, them really. Know. But IOM is, is doing also how, how, a good job. How there. has your commission been able to engage the the Nigerian diasporans who are skilled uh, collection of skilled manpower that are abroad that you can use in this year advocacy? Yes, uh, as I mentioned, we are working with different um, government bodies. We have an office of the diaspora and we are working with them to see we've, we've, we've traveled and so many when times you say together. We are working, what kind of work? Tell working us. as in to see how we can tap this um, expertise of these people for them to, for us to persuade them to come back home. And most of them gladly really want to come back home. It's just that the decision to come back is, is, is difficult maybe for them, <laughs> but they want to come back. <laughs> Federal Commissioner, um, at the United Nations General Assembly in September, you attended uh, one of the major <coughs> events, uh, which was captioned, Say No to Modern Day Slavery, A Call to Action. And it was obvious from that event that this is a complex issue. It is not peculiar to Nigeria alone. There are many countries who give testimonies of the challenges they face. And it was a good opportunity for countries to network with other countries um, to see what they're doing to make this situation better in their own countries. What um, did you take away from that event? Were you able to network with some other yeah, yes. bodies, especially international yes, bodies? Yes, so we've met with, as you mentioned, with different um, bodies. And that, uh, that conference was really a call to action, a stop, a say no to, to modern day slavery. But uh, you know, this, this, this modern day slavery is, is a kind of an international uh, syndicate mm. body, you know, that has to be tackled by respective governments globally. Because you have to know this, uh, syndicates before you be able to address uh, the issue and for us we are a humanitarian agency really so ours is limited to really when these people come back we take care of them all right well, in terms of support were you able to network with some of these uh, 
international agencies. Yes, we see. have. You know, already we have IM, we, we have UNSCR, we have the Norwegian Refugee Council that, that we are working with, and other NGOs. The, your, the, work, the kind of work we do um, suggests that you need a lot of funding. Um, and you have a, a, a roadmap which you launch and so on and so forth. Is the money there? I mean, um, well, are you are you well funded? The, to the do money this will can never be enough. We we'll always ask for for more. But truly, uh, it's a very big challenge. Paucity of funds is a major challenge because as it is now, we are only funded through uh, budgetary allocation, and that is really inadequate. But we hope that uh, once we get uh, our act reenacted, we'll be able to have other sources uh, of, of funding. So where are you at the stage of the, having the act? It is at its final stage. I think it's oh, going really? back for, yes. Uh, You've done the public hearing? We've done the public, we've done the first, second, third reading. And wow. We're, we're, we're almost done, inshallah. That was fast. <laughs> You know the <laughs> National Assembly system very well then. <laughs> now, let's, uh, you are a distinguished woman politician. Uh, it will be interesting to hear from you. Uh, what's your assessment of women's participation in politics, first in Zamfara State and maybe in Nigeria at large? <laughs> See, that's not... That's not a fair <laughs> question, Mohammed. <Mami. laughs> Why are you starting with my state? Well, Charity, yeah, I Charity am a woman woman. politician and I am from Zamfara State. And I will tell you that uh, women participate very actively in Zamfara State. I think we even have um, two or three um, women that have been given uh, federal appointments from Zamfara State. I know of myself, I know of Fatima. Shinkafi and one other one. And when it comes to politics, politics really, women are very active in Zamfara State. So we, we, we hope that women will be more active or will be more. Uh, you know why I asked you that question and I said you politics. should start from Zamfara. Zamfara is known of a, as a state that is conservative, both in religion and ethnicity, ethnicity coloration, and what have you. So, how is it? What is actually happening coming from you? Everybody will want to hear. Uh, you know, I, I, I went for an election in Zamfara State in 2014. I wanted to contest for the House of Representatives. And uh, the reception I got was really unbelievable. It was my first outing, and I was, uh, was really received by the people. It was really overwhelming, you know, but Somewhere along the line, I, I didn't make it, but I was given the opportunity. You didn't make it at the stage of the primaries? At the stage of the primaries, de okay. definitely, as, at the stage of the, I was, in my constituency, I think I was the only woman, maybe in Zamfara State, I was the only woman that came out to contest for that position, but I was given the chance to do that, and I was widely accepted by the people. So I will not say that um, because of um, conservativeness or, I don't think there's even anything like ethnicity in Zamfara State, maybe a uh, religious aspect of it, but I was accepted and I was given the chance so to So it contest. was the political party that disenfranchised you then? It was the powers that be <laughs> that disenfranchised <laughs> me, not even the political party. Now, <laughs> talking about primaries generally, different faces were brought into the political lexicon of Nigeria direct primaries, indirect primaries, and what have you. Which one do you think favors women politicians most? Any one of them can favor them. Direct primaries has its own advantages, and it also has its, its own disadvantages. So also indirect. It depends on the particular uh, or the peculiar environment one is coming from. There's nothing wrong with uh, direct primaries, but some people are saying it's not easy to manage or to handle. It can be porous. In direct primaries, people are scared of the delegates, you know. If you don't, maybe you have money, it will be very difficult for you. So whichever one, it has its own 
advantages and disadvantages. And I think the most important thing for for a candidate or an, an aspirant is for him to get the support of his constituents. All right, Federal Commissioner, I would like to take you back to the issue of um, migration. Um, I know that there's a major summit coming up uh, in Morocco towards the end of the year, and I know that Nigeria is also preparing for that summit as well as some uh, other member countries. What is the objective of Nigeria and Africa when you get to Morocco? Well, the, the objective is for Nigeria and Africa to adopt a common compact, a common policy. That is the global compact on migration, which will be transmitted to the United Nations. We've had a series of conferences where inputs were guided from different uh, critical stakeholders in the country. We went to AU. We presented our position as Nigeria. And then the African position was also developed. And that is what is going to uh, be adopted in Marrakesh by the heads of government. What are some of the critical issues, if you could let us in? Well, the critical issues mainly are the issue of how we are going to tackle this uh, issue of irregular migration. And then also the issue of aligning migration with development. We want to really move away from the narratives of this negativism of migration. It also has its own uh, positive, uh, positive uh, mm -hmm. impacts. So we want to see how we, you know, we can harness that with these developing countries where these, our nationals migrate to, so that there won't be need for them to go through the irregular routes to migrate. If, if the system is strengthened, you know, these strict visa uh, policies are relaxed, and then we have an uh, exchange of uh, labor between us. It, it will be much more uh, tidier for people to want to migrate, and then after a period of time, they come back. So, so this is all what is in that compact. Are you going there with a side uh, line event? Yes, we, we hope to have uh, a side event in Marrakesh. Now, like um, what? On bringing the people uh, and the critical stakeholders on board to see how we can uh, uh, champion this cause of moving away from the negative to the uh, positive narrative. In Marrakesh, you just told us you will be looking at migration along with development. Mm. What will you say to the irony, or if you like, uh, uh, the challenge? of the two narratives now. Nigerians or Africans who migrate to Europe or the United States, most of them are unskilled, are already skilled. And then, the, whereas we have unskilled ones also going there and then becoming modern slave, uh, 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 becoming victims of modern slavery. So how do, how do you marry the two and then how can we get development? You see, even this, this, this the people that go through the irregular Route. It will. It, it might surprise you to know that most of them are even graduates. Sorry. Really. So if we have a, a partnership with these uh, developed countries, okay, these people want to come to learn certain kind of um, uh, job. You know, for a period of time, we will sign an agreement. They can go do that and come back home and uh, practice that uh, trade that they, they must have learned. And that's why we are linking migration uh, with development. Now, um, there's something that um, is often say that, you know, when there is crisis, the first victims are women and children. I'm wondering to what extent you have seen that in your work, whether here in Nigeria or uh, out of Nigeria. Is it, does it really reflect in what you are doing? Oh, yes, there are, and there are always... So, what, mm. what then is the way out for people that have been caught up in, in this kind of order? Especially that you're working on a migration policy. Yes, they are, they are always the, the most hit. They are the vulnerable groups, women and children, and we always give special attention to this group. Even in our intervention, we make sure that uh, we, we cater for them. Women, their health issues, Issue of issue of their uh, hygiene and sanitation, mm -hmm. 
issue of the, there's this thing we call the dignity uh, kit when we give them nutrition for the children. So we will always make sure that we capture the needs of these uh, vulnerable groups. What of education? What of education? education is, does yes, it come up in, it in this part kind of, of it? Education, health, they are all very important. We take educational kids to, to, to the camps. Okay. We take educational kids to the way we are this time around. We are even going to start this uh, feeding program for the children in the camp in this uh, 2018 intervention. We give them school uniforms, school bags, lunch bags, writing and reading materials. That is also part of the intervention we take to, to the children as far as the education is concerned. Now that we're talking about women and children, um, I visited an IDP camp recently and I noticed that truly most of those you find there are women and children. And I also, it was on a Saturday, I noticed that many non-governmental organizations were there. Mm. Um, and I want to find out from your commission, what are you doing to ensure that some of these non-governmental organizations don't take advantage of these vulnerable people to make money off them? Because we've had that in the past. Yes, uh, you know, the, the, uh, there's, there, are, there are procedures of allowing these uh, international organizations or not governmental organizations to participate in the um, intervention that we give to these um, displaced people. Before you can do that, I think you have to be registered. It has to go through the Ministry of Budget and National Planning. So if those people are being screened and registered, you must allow them to go and, and work in the camps. Ours is for us to be very vigilant so that we don't have such cases. And when we have such cases, we report them to the appropriate um, authorities. As who I always who is responsible for the coordination of the assistance right. and support that these agencies give to the IDPs? You see, honestly, this is a very big question. We have a uh, NEMA that's supposed to coordinate camp management. The commission's mandate is to coordinate the durable solution aspect of it, which we are doing. The UN body also has its own coordination group that is coordinating all the UN agencies under its umbrella. So there, there are different um, phases of coordination, with different uh, types of coordination as far as the issue of... Uh, Kudu, you see, that's IDP where the challenge of synergy comes in, because you find these non-governmental organizations taking pictures and writing back mm. to donor agencies abroad to say <laughs> this is what they're doing. And no, most no, of the funding no, well, does not get They give only 5% and exactly. take 9%. That's right. Percent. So I think that's a big challenge. And the IDP policy you are working is, on... Is going to the, address all the, these issues, the, definitely. The act you're also uh, trying to mm. bring together should, should all either specify, either it should be your mm. commission mm -hmm. or NEMA or whichever agency, or NAPTI, I think. You know, in the policy, like I mentioned, there are different thematic leads. When it comes to issues of trafficking, it's definitely an that will coordinate. When it comes to issues of emergency, it should be NEMA. But when it comes to issues of rehabilitation, resettlement, reintegration, empowerment, this is the National Commission for Refugees, Migrants, and Internally Displaced Persons that should do that. On the issues of health, we have Federal Ministry of Health. When it comes to education, Federal Ministry of Education. So, like I said, this uh, IDP policy is just the best thing that can happen to this country once it is adopted because every agency's role and responsibility is clearly spelled out. Will be spelled out. Uh, very last question. You have just one minute to answer it. As a politician from Zamfara, how do you feel when INEC says you are not fielding nobody for the 2019 <laughs> general elections? Of course, it was very devastating. And I hope, I hope, and I hope that it will not be so, that something will happen. <laughs> Hajia Saduya Umar Farouk, Federal Commissioner, National Commission for Refugees, Migrants, and the Internally Displaced Persons. Thank you so very much for coming on our platform. Thank you. And we look forward to you having this IGP policy, to having the Enabling Act, and mm -hmm. then we will bring you back again and see 
and see how far so far. Thank you so much for having me, Mahama. Joy Osiago, as usual, you did not disappoint me. Thank you so <laughs> very much for your insight. Thank you for having me. Makut Simon Macha, always there. <laughs> Thank you, mm. sir. Thank you so Thank much. You for the imperative of finding durable solutions to the challenge of persons of concern, which includes asylum seekers, refugees, IDPs, returnees, and stateless persons, was our focus in the past 50 minutes. Our guest, Sadia Omar Farouk, Federal Commissioner, National Commission for Refugees, Migrants, and IDPs, emphasized the need to implement standardized procedures and the Commission's roadmap for action. She enumerated several challenges but says, with collaboration and support of government and stakeholders, a lot has been achieved. That's Platform. I am Muhammad Kuda Wabakar. Thank you for watching and see you next time in the next edition. Thank you.